Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend. Today, we're gonna to be looking at a fascinating topic, spruce beer. Thanks for joining us as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. Spruce beer has this incredibly rich history. It's not only yummy, but it's important as a, a health property. And it's so important that it's part of the military rations. Let me read to you a piece from 1775, General Orders. And here's Congress, and they're talking about rations for soldiers. Uh, each, uh, the following ration of provisions is allowed by Continental Congress to each soldier. A pound of fresh beef, a pound of bread, three pints of peas, that's per week, not per day, a pint of milk per day per man if it's available, a half pint of rice per man per week, and here's the good one, a quart of spruce beer uh, per man per day, or we'll get to this later on, nine gallons of molasses per company of 100 men per week. So there it is showing up right there in the military rations in 1775. This is drank by just regular people. It's, it's soldiers and sailors, people in fortifications. It's incredibly important in the 18th century. So what exactly is spruce beer? It's technically not truly a beer by a modern sense, but it's made in very similar way. It's, it's also very, very similar to the ginger beer that we've made in the past, if you've seen that episode. But the major sort of flavoring ingredient and the major portion of its medicinal properties come from spruce. And the spruce that's mainly used in the 18th century is black spruce. That's the spruce everybody wants, uh, but that really only grows in the very, very northern part of North America. So, you know, maybe Massachusetts and north, sort of the half, uh, halfway in Michigan and north of that, of course, all over Canada, you have black spruce. Uh, sometimes people use white spruce in the time period. And if you're down south, say in South Carolina, you would use pine doesn't make nearly as good a spruce beer, but some people did make it up. And spruce beer has this, has this um, history that goes all the way back, say, into the 17th century. Um, Native Americans were helping out those folks in, in Canada that were sick with scurvy. They made a spruce drink, not really a beer, but a drink, and uh, that cured them. They, they, uh, the, the Europeans sort of converted that and said, let's make beer out of it instead. Well, it turns out that when you boil spruce, you get rid of all the wonderful vitamin C that was really good for it, but people still considered it a health drink. So we need to have uh, the ingredient of spruce in our spruce beer. How are we gonna make that? That's what we're gonna do. We need to collect up some spruce cuttings. Let's go out and get some spruce cuttings. We want some nice, soft, uh, spruce trees, if we can get it. And this is the perfect time of year, early summer. We got some new growth here, this nice green part, soft, tender. It's got a lot of good flavor to it. If it's winter time and you've only got the older growth, that's what they did. If they needed uh, spruce and they needed that vitamin C, even in the winter, you could still go to your, your uh, spruce tree. It's still green. You can get some cuttings from that. We've got our cuttings and I kind of chopped them down a little bit. Uh, and now we just toss them into some boiling water and, and uh, really we just need, we're just gonna cover them up with as much water as possible. And the recipes all sort of agree that we boil this uh, for an hour, two hours until the bark starts to peel off of the stick. Um, the, the problem with that is, is really the, the, the vitamin C that's built into spruce, that's the, really the good part, the healing part, it gets destroyed by this boiling process. So uh, they did this in the 18th century. They didn't know that that was what was happening. There is a caveat here that I also want to give, and that is we have to be careful about what we're cutting. We can't just go out into, you know, into the yard or into the forest and cut any old willy-nilly evergreen because there are some evergreens that are poisonous. The wonderful thing about a spruce tree is the whole thing is basically edible. It's really weird. Uh, you can get, you know, peel off the inner bark raw and eat it. You can eat the nettles. You can eat the sticks. You can eat everything on a spruce tree. It's actually good for you right off the tree. Uh, but if you get something like a juniper or some kinds of cedar, they're poisonous. So know your tree before you go cutting. If 
You can boil this for approximately an hour. Now that this is done, all we have to do is strain the liquid out and leave the pine needles behind. So one of the very, very interesting things about this is you would think it would have this super piney smell, but actually it has this wonderful sort of food smell to it. Uh, it really, really smells good. So while we can make our own spruce essence, and many recipes talk about making spruce essence, most of the recipes actually refer straight to spruce essence as a product that you could buy. And, and they were making spruce essence and selling it um, all over, most of the recipes, the vast majority actually say, just use spruce essence. And today we can still buy spruce essence. You can find it um, at a brewing supply store that's uh, close to you, or you can find it on Amazon. Uh, so you can make your own spruce beer actually very easily, especially if you just wanna buy the spruce essence, you know it's, it's actually got some of the best flavor compared to uh, maybe using a blue spruce, which isn't as good. If you've got access to black spruce, you might wanna make your own, but this is actually gonna work really good, and that's what we're gonna to use today. Now that we've talked about spruce essence, let's talk about the other ingredients, and, and in fact, let's talk about the recipe that we're gonna be using today. Uh, we could use Amelia Simmons' uh, recipe from 1796. Excellent uh, recipe in the very back of this cookbook. This cookbook is available um, on our website, but today I'm gonna to be using a very, very simple recipe from 1788, very similar uh, time period. This is Philadelphia 1788. Now this one's not called spruce beer, but you'll see here, they call it maple beer. To every four gallons of water while boiling, add a quart of maple molasses. When the liquor is cooled to blood heat, put in as much yeast as is necessary to foment it. I like that, foment it. <laughs> uh, malt or bran may be added to this beer when agreeable. If a tablespoon of the essence of spruce is added to the above quantities of water and molasses, it makes a most delicious and wholesome drink. So this is pretty simple, right? It's only got a very, very few ingredients. We've got water here. We want nice, clear, good, soft water if we can get it. Uh, we need our sugar, which is in this case, maple molasses, or you know it as maple syrup. We need some essence of spruce. We've already created that, or even more likely, we've bought it. it uh, that's the good stuff. It really tastes good. And we need some yeast. We need some ale yeast, or any kind of brewing yeast is gonna work. If you don't have anything else, and you wanna make this right away, you can use bread yeast, but if you're gonna be ordering your spruce essence, order some ale yeast at the same time. It's not very expensive. Now, most recipes in the 18th century uh, actually call for just straight up molasses. And what they probably mean is regular cane uh, molasses, uh, dark you know, molasses that's a byproduct of making sugar. Tastes great, but in this, re in this kind of recipe, it really brings too much flavor to it. It overpowers the spruce. We don't want that to happen. So I really recommend this particular recipe that uses maple syrup. If you don't wanna use maple syrup, you can also use cane syrup that's available in the store. That's gonna give you the most spruce flavor. Uh, even this maple might bring in a little bit more flavor than you want, but I think it's a perfect mix, maple and spruce together. So I really recommend this one. Uh, you can try it with the, with the regular uh, molasses. I, just, I think it just way overpowers it though. So let's get started making this recipe. We've got our water. I've already got it warmed up a little bit. We're gonna put this over the fire in this case, and we want to get it heated up. We're gonna be using this two gallons as our uh, particular recipe. Um, and most of the recipes have this same sort of um, ratio of sugar to water. So it's about eight to one. So for two gallons of water, we have a quart of maple syrup. I'm just gonna go ahead and pour our quart right in. And then our next ingredient is our essence of spruce. And we're gonna use about, oh, let's say two ounces of spruce essence here. Now this, we're gonna bring this up to a boil. Uh, many of the 18th century recipes would actually have us boil this for a long time. Some of them have the water uh, to be boiled uh, until it's half as much which is crazy. They did that on purpose. They thought in the 18th century that the effervescence 
uh, that comes from a brewed beer or other kind of brewing things. They, they thought that those bubbles actually came from the boiling of this wort. Uh, but, it, but we know today that, of course, all that effervescence is because of the yeast. So we know that the only point of really getting this to boil is basically to sterilize the batch here. We want to kill everything off, so we're gonna bring this up to a boil and then immediately, as soon as it's boiling, uh, just for a minute or so, we're actually gonna let it cool off. Remember that substitution in the, uh, the, the soldier's rations where it said they either got a gallon of spruce beer or they got molasses as a substitute? They got molasses as a substitute so they could make their own spruce beer. That's the one component that it would be the most difficult to come up with. So that's why the substitute ration for spruce beer is molasses, so the soldiers could make their own. We've got our mixture in our fermenting vessel, and now it's ready for the next step. If this is cooled down to blood temperature and cooler, we want to be able to put our finger in it and say, oh, no heat there. Right, we want it to be below blood temperature. Now we can pitch our yeast and we've got our ale yeast. This is the kind of yeast that the brewer would take off a batch of beer and he'd use it for the next batch. That's exactly what we're using here. So we've got some yeast and we're gonna just pour that in, maybe about a pint. And that's good for our two gallons. If you're using a modern yeast that comes in a packet, usually those are meant for five gallon batches. So you'd use about a half a batch. And those uh, yeast have, those yeast packets have very particular directions. So follow the directions on the packet for the temperature uh, and exactly how you put it in there. Cause each one's a little bit different. This is ready. It's going to start fermenting right away and uh, it will ferment for the next couple of days. But for right now, we're just gonna cover this up. If you're using a modern equipment, you know, you, you'd be using special, you know, things that keep the air out. But in the 18th century, they didn't do that. We're just gonna put a nice lid on here, keep the dust out, and it's gonna start percolating away. So this has been working a couple of days now. Let's take a look at it and yeah, it looks really good. It's, uh, it's been um, fermenting. There's still a few bubbles coming on this, but it's mostly fermented away. Now we can use it. We could drink it right now, perfectly good. We can also bottle this up and they would have, they had directions for that. So uh, we're just gonna uh, basically ladle this off and put it right into uh, some stoneware bottles. You might use a glass bottle for this and we, bo we can bottle this for short periods of time. Sometimes they say this will last a while, but I would again recommend this to be used fairly rapidly. But if we bottle it, we can get some effervescence from it. Um, that's uh, another thing to remember that uh, this is still going to ferment a little bit. It's going to pressurize that bottle. And just like the ginger beer, if you have too much sugar and it's still fermenting a lot in the bottle, it might explode. Or it might build up so much pressure that it's hard to uncork and you'll get, you know, it basically all of it comes out instead of, uh, instead of being able to drink it. So um, you don't want to, you want this to bottle up to get a little bit of carbonation, not too much, or it's very, very difficult to, to uncork. Well, we've got a great look to it. It's, uh, it's got a wonderful smell to it, not like pine saw that you might worry about. It's like, oh, it's got spruce, it's got pine in it. It's just not like that at all. Um, I'm really interested to see how this particular batch turned out because each one sort of has its own thing going on. So let's give it a try. There's still a little bit of carbonation. Uh, that's good. It, it hasn't, um, it, I haven't let this carbonate a long time. We've got a, a several different flavors coming in here. We've got certainly the, the spruce and that kind of comes in in the smell but the maple syrup flavor is still there and that is really good. So you're mixing this wonderful smooth uh, spray spruce with the uh, maple syrup and a little bit of yeast, uh, but not in a bad way at all. Mm, very refreshing. You make a great summertime drink. Boy, that, that is a, a very unique, but very good uh, flavor. If you get a chance, this one's, this one's one to try out. I really recommend this one. It's simple to do, a lot of fun. Uh, you know, if you love this video and you want more, make sure to subscribe. And if you'd like a similar uh, episode where we do ginger beer, check out this one.